Welcome to the beautiful day on the Abonito Show. I am your host, Dorimar Bonilla, and today we have a very special guest, Benjamin Hernandez, board chair of the AMA, the Association for the Advancement of the Mexican American. Welcome, Ben. Yes, thank you. Thank you for having me here. It's such a pleasure having you and having you here to speak about AMA and I know you have a Mexican background. Yes. You are from Monterrey. Monterrey born in, yes. Can you tell our guests a little bit about your journey? Yeah, absolutely. I was uh, born in Monterrey, Mexico, and I was brought over when I was a child, eight months old, and uh, essentially grew up here in Houston, and, and this is the only country that I've ever known. Um, and so I'm, I'm glad to be here with you today and, and talk about the important work that we're doing at AMA. Growing up, did you follow a lot of your Mexican traditions, or would you say that when you moved here, your lifestyle changed a lot? Uh, no, I, I'm, I'm very thankful to, to my mom because one of the things that she said is she said, listen, you are going to uh, learn English in schools, but here at home, you're going to speak, read, and write Spanish. And that's one of the things that has just stuck with me and just such an important gift that she gave me and I'm so thankful because essentially I grew up in this country but being able to know the language speak it and write it uh, along with all the other cultural traditions I think my mom and, and my family it was really important to them to keep those alive even though we are living in a new country stay true to your roots absolutely yes. yeah. and our producer is actually also Mexican-American he is born in Guadalajara also raised in the States just like you uh -huh. and the mission of your organization is extremely important to him and also to us you know the rest of us at our show but I would like for you to share with our audience the mission of your organization sure so AMA the Ad uh, Association for the Advancement of Mexican-Americans uh, based here in, in Houston Texas you know, our mission is to empower and inspire the next generation of Latino leaders. Uh, and a core component of that work is our educational program. Um, we have a school and around there is where we center all of our work at AMA. Tell me about this school. Yeah, absolutely. So um, by definition, the school is a charter. But I like to think of it more as the public's public school. And, and here's what I mean by that. Um, we at AMA, we take in the students that for whatever reason can't uh, be in a public school or have been through a public school, but that didn't work. We take in students uh, on purpose who don't know English. We take in students who are economically disadvantaged, who have challenges in their lives, uh, and, and, and we build a support system around them. And so that's why I say it's like the, the public's public school, because when I think of education, I think education, sure, education should be at the center of it, but it's also about the support systems and structures you build around a student and their families and community to really get that value out of the education. And education has re it's really, really, really powerful yes. in the upbringing of any individual. Absolutely. So it's a great thing that AMA is doing for the Latino community. You do support the Latin community in uh, various ways. Um, would you be able to tell me what are some of the most important needs of the Latin community? Yeah, I think especially in this environment, I, I can think of three things, and, and they're really all around basic needs, whether it's uh, healthcare, whether it's uh, food security, or whether it's housing. And I think especially during the last year and a half that we all have been living in, um, these are the things that have really come up and risen up to the center of the needs that we, that we need to address. And so from the perspective of AMA, is looking at those three and saying, how can we meet the needs of the people that we serve? And again, it's not just about the, the, the student. It is about the family and it is about community because that's the way really that we strengthen communities and we, it, we inspire and build the next generation of Latino leaders here. And you mentioned the past year and a half, but I know that your organization has actually been servicing the community yeah. for 50 years, which is an incredible accomplishment. It's an amazing Congratulations. milestone. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Um, but how would you say the past year and a half has changed? Well, AMA, since its inception, has all been about people and community and serving people directly. And obviously, this last year has changed that, right? So going from... Uh, directly meeting the needs of families. Uh, we've had to turn to a different model. How do we do this in an environment where we can't be in front of people 
all of the time. And, and a core part of that has been our education. Obviously, like a lot of places around the country, our educational programs had to go virtual. But one of the things that we've learned is that students learn better in a classroom. And so um, part of what we are doing this year is how do we get students back in safely? Uh, and not only that, so we can continue to provide those support systems to them, to the family, and the communities that we serve. What are some of the current projects that AMA is working on? Sure, so, um, you know, we, we obviously, uh, during COVID, what it's, it's about meeting those basic needs of families, uh, as we talked about, and, and building those support systems around them so that, um, as a community, we come out better than we did before. Now, that, that's, a, that's a challenge, right? Because the reality is that this has impacted people in so many different ways. Um, and one of the things that, that we have coming on the pipeline is our gala at the end of the year. This is our fundraising gala. And we do this so we can have the funds to build those support systems and structures around our educational programs. Excellent. And there are so many success stories within the services that your organization provides and the things that you've been able to accomplish. If there was one that would stand out that you would want to share with us, what would that be? Yeah, absolutely. I think this has to be centered around education. And this year, we had to hire a superintendent. Um, and as a board chair, I get a lot of flexibility in how I craft that process. And for me, it was very important to develop a process that really included the stakeholders that were going to be impacted by this new hire. So I built a committee of seven people, three board members, no surprise there. But what I did differently is I put on that committee uh, an administrator of the schools, a principal of the schools, a teacher of the schools, and a student. So everybody gets involved. So everybody gets involved. And, that's great. You know, some people looked at me and they said, you know, that's, that's a little bit crazy. Like, how are you going to put, you know, teachers and students here? But to me, it was like, why not? But it makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Because if you think about it, having a student on the committee gets you that perspective, you know, from a person that's going to be impacted by this hire. And, and what really stands out, having that committee, this was a student, a 12th grader, in a room full of, you know, uh, professionals, right? And people who have careers and, and, uh, and working professional lives. But that student, at key points in that interview process, was able to point out things that we all missed. And so to me, when I think of the story of Amma and what we're doing, it's that student giving them those opportunities um, that they're gonna look back on their life and say, hey, I had an opportunity to hire somebody when I was in school. And it just builds on that skill set. And I'm grateful for that opportunity. Because like I said, without that student, we would have missed some critical things. I can imagine the ability to make the difference yeah. because you have a set of eyes that have a different perspective as well. Exactly. It's important. I have to say, we are very inspired by what you do, by your organization, and I am sure our audience is going to be very inspired as well, and also very intrigued, so can you please let them know where they can find out more about the organization? Yeah, absolutely. So if you want to learn more about what we do at AMA, uh, go to our website, that's AMA.org, A-A-M-A.org, or look us up on Facebook, that's AMA, the Association for the Advancement of Mexican Americans. Well, thank you, Ben, for joining us today. Thank you for having me. We are excited to hear more about AMA and what you guys are up to and all your events and all of your projects. So we'll be tuning in to your social media for that. I am Dorimar Bonilla, your host for the beautiful day on Dia Bonito Show. Thank you for tuning in. We'll be back with more. Welcome to the beautiful day on the Abonito Show. I am your host, Dorimar Bonilla, and today I couldn't be more excited to have an icon of the world of media and entertainment, Marlies Bolan of the Anglophile channel. Marlies is a very busy gal, so she is in Hollywood working on a very special project that she'll talk to us about in a little bit. But because of the art of technology, we are lucky enough that we get to have her join us on a Zoom. Welcome, Marlies. Thank you so much for having me, Tori. I don't think I've ever been called an icon before. <laughs> so well, I, we believe you are an icon. You have done incredible things in your career. Let's just start with the fact that you were the first Latina Miss California. And within that, you were third runner up, I believe, in Miss America as well. At a time where Latinas were not doing this exactly. Please tell me about that. Uh, yeah, I was the first Latina Miss California at a time where diversity and inclusion wasn't part of the conversation. So the headlines never read 
first Mexican American or first uh, Latina wins Miss California and goes to Miss America. So though that they didn't lead with that. So a big deal wasn't made about that, which, you know, and I didn't know enough to promote that at the time. So I just kind of went along my way and just became, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't a milestone for anyone, but looking back, I realized what an important thing it was because, you know, during those days we didn't have, you know, the JLo's and the Selma Hayek's sort of paving the way for other Latina uh, artists, you know, to, to write, raise through the rise through the ranks, I should say. Um, so, you know, now looking back, I think it was an accomplishment and, you know, and I'm honored to have been, uh, to have achieved that milestone. You achieved a milestone and you opened doors for other Latinas following after you, I'm sure of that, because, you know, it's been a long road for us Latinas and it is amazing women like you who have helped those steps along the way. And as a Mexican American, please share with me a little bit about your background. Well, from uh, through my father's side, I'm Mexican. Um, my great grandmother hailed from Jalisco, Mexico, but she came to America as a young bride, leaving behind nine brothers and sisters back in their ranch in, in Guadalajara. Uh, so I was born and raised here. My mother was born and raised here. Uh, but all our family came from Mexico. So I was actually raised in my great grandmother's house, pretty much. They all spoke Spanish. So that's how I learned the language. And you know, funny story was I thought when I had to take a foreign language in, in school, I thought, well, I'm going to take Spanish because I'm going to ace this, right? Well, my grandmother came from a place and a time in Mexico where Spanish, you know, their Spanish wasn't exactly the correct Spanish. So right. I, and my Spanish class thinking I was going to ace it and, you know, I couldn't have been more wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I just remember growing up in my grandmother's house and, you know, and smelling the food that she used to make, homemade tortillas and little, you know, little masas, she called them, and, and menudo and just things that, you know, you know, actually, I, I never should have learned to make and I never did. Um, those were the foods of my of my early years and and the music. We used to listen to mariachi music and I used to see my grandmother dancing around the living room like a little jigs. And it was just, you know, so whenever I hear that music now or smell those scents of Mexican food, it just takes me back to those years of growing up in my great grandmother's house. And and I get I get choked up. I get very emotional over it. I understand how that is, you know, coming from Puerto Rico, obviously I grew up in the island very close with my grandparents as well and with my culture and it doesn't matter where I go in the world, I hold my culture so dear and close to my heart. So I'm sure it's the same for you. But you know, I can relate in the sense that I wanted to explore the world and, and, and get into entertainment. And from a very early age, you wanted to become an entertainer as well. And your career started out in acting and grew into shows like Guys and Dolls, West Side Story, and A Chorus Line. What drew you into the production side of the business? Uh, wanting to be in control of my own destiny, wanting to create my own opportunities. Uh, like I said, uh, coming up as an actress in the 80s, uh, the diversity and inclusion conversation wasn't prominent. So I remember the, uh, the agents that I had, they, they liked putting you in little boxes and little categories because it was easy for them. They had little categories in there you know, with all the headshots of their actors. So in those days, to audition for a role, it had to specifically say Latino, Latina actress, you know. The so-called typecasting. Yeah, it was very typecasting. So yeah, I was very stuck into that. And so again, they used to send me out for a lot of Spanish speaking uh, work, like Spanish speaking commercials, you know, that were shot by, you know, in Mexico. And I'd be up against girls that were from Mexico that looked a little bit more you know, of the culture than I did and had the accents and spoke the language perfectly, you know, not the, the B student that I was in Spanish. Um, so it was a challenge for me. And I used to, I used to try to really beg them and struggle with them to just send me out for normal, normal roles. roles so, yeah. Yeah. So eventually I think I just, we just started creating our own creative projects uh, because, you know, you want to be in control of things. And also in those days, I tell my daughter this all the time, in those days, you were an actor. 
Yes. You weren't an actor and a writer and a producer because then they'd look at you and say, well, wh which one are you? Because I just think their brains operated that way. They needed, oh. again, to put you in a little category. Today, it's all about diversifying. It's all about being mul a multi-talented individual. You have to have multi-diverse you know, diverse interests and talents now. Now you should be a writer, a director, a producer, you know, like Reese Witherspoons or Sama Hayek or, you know, any of the act actresses that are also running their own production companies. Today, it's revered and expected. Back then, you're either an actor or you're a writer or you're a dancer, you're this or that. They didn't want to know that you had more than one talent. Absolutely. And you have grown your brand into multiple areas. You have gone from acting to singing to being a beauty queen to being a producer and a writer and um, you have experienced a broad range of the entertainment world. What would you say is your favorite side of the business? Uh, the side of the business where I'm in charge, <laughs> where I don't have to depend on other people uh, to achieve my goals, to achieve my dreams. Um, of course, you have to work, you know, you have to be a good team player and work with others and, and everything, and it takes a village, but I, I like sort of being in charge of my own destiny, and I would just remember all those years of sitting by and waiting the phone to ring, waiting for the phone to ring, uh, you know, did I get the part, you know, did I get the audition, you know, <laughs> never mind the part, you know, so I just, I think from that just led to the idea that, no, we need to do something creative we need to be producing and writing and doing our own our own stuff as opposed to just kind of waiting around for opportunity to find us and uh, talk to me about the anglophile channel it's in its eighth year now and it's known for highlighting british culture and lifestyle entertainment style and a variety of subjects what is it that made the love for britain come about in in the eu what what is it about britain that you love so much well, you know, I've always been fascinated with British culture. I mean, there's just an element of fantasy there, isn't it? I've always been fascinated with the royal family. We don't have kings and queens here in America. I've always been fascinated with their history and their traditions and their literature and their architecture. I mean, all of it. So I've, I've sort of been obsessed. And someone who's obsessed specifically with England is an Anglophile. But, you know, it, in for us, the Anglophile channel represents all of Britain and the UK, actually, which includes Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. So, um, and it came from visiting there. You know, we, as you know, we traveled as entertainers uh, and we were blessed to be able to visit places like Africa and China and South America and just all corners of the world, just falling in love with different cultures and everything, but nothing struck home or, you know, um, hit the heart more than being in England for some reason. I just absolutely loved it. So I decided to create the Anglophile channel, which was about people who are obsessed with British culture. And we created this reality series where we cast women who much like me were obsessed with some aspect of British culture. And they each had a secret dream or a secret wish of you know, indulging themselves in some Anglophile fantasy, whether that was putting on a Jane Austen gown and dancing at a ball at Chatsworth, you know, uh, or meeting Colin Firth, the original Mr. Darcy, or you know, having tea with the Queen, whatever whatever their crazy fantasies were, you know. Um, so we did this reality series uh, highlighting women. Uh, it was mainly women at that point that that had these obsessions over over the UK. And from that reality series, we grew it into a whole channel. So it not only became about the that obsession, it also became food and culture pieces. We did a lot of red carpets. Um, we did a lot of interviewing at film openings like Downton Abbey and Emma. We did recap and review shows uh, of Outlander and again, Downton Abbey. So and we, we began to partner with big companies and and entities like the British Consulate in Los Angeles, where we were able to stage 
our first British Artist of the Year Award in person, where we honored Downton Abbey's Julian Fellows, who's the writer creator of it, and um, Gareth Neem. And so it was a spectacular event held there at the British residence. And, you know, it was sort of a culmination of all these years of working on the Anglophile channel, getting to finally reach this level and um, celebrate, celebrate British artistry and, uh, and, and our achievements. And there's a large community of British artists in Los Angeles where you're based out of. Yeah. So yeah, you're there's a huge in, British yeah. community, mm -hmm. especially like in the Santa Monica area. And there's pubs that we love to go to, like Ye Old King's Head Pub, you know, where I go for my favorite fish and chips and afternoon tea. And it just feels like, you know, a little bit of England here in Southern California. I'm going to have to visit that area and exile yeah. in LA. I have to go to tea. I can't yes. wait to take you to tea. We have to go to tea together. Yes, we will. But circling back with the Latin culture, uh, Marlies, you are also a member of the Writers Guild of America. And within that guild, there is a Latino-centric committee that you belong to. Um, how does this group represent the interests of our Latin community? Yeah, well, the, the uh, WGA, Latinx Writers Committee, does just that. So they're there to represent the interests of Latinx writers, making sure they're represented in the industry, and also making sure that there's opportunities and that their voice is heard. Because again, in the conversation of diversity and inclusion, you know, one, one of the, I feel, uh, one of the voices that don't, doesn't quite get heard loud enough is the Latinx uh, voice. And so thanks to the entities like this, like this Writers uh, Guild Committee, um, there is a pathway for writers, you know, and, and for producers and for artists that are of Latin descent, you know, and, and I think it's important because, um, you know, where they always say America is a huge melting pot. And so we need to represent all that makes up our great country and the the latin voice you know and the latin artists is is definitely a large part of that absolutely and tying up to that we hear that you have some exciting news about a special project that you're working on i don't know how much you can share but can you please tell us anything and everything you can absolutely i'm currently writing i'm co-writing uh, a movie uh, for cbs viacom who owns Paramount Pictures, and we're really excited that they bought our pitch. Uh, it's a high school romantic comedy. It's set during prom season, and that's about all I could tell you about the plot. But um, it was very important for me as a Latin writer that my voice uh, be represented in the movie somehow. So I'm really excited to say that the lead is actually going to be a Mexican-American uh, yes. character. And so all that comes with that is delving into her culture. And she has a family that very much is reminiscent of my family with the, the tias and the abuelitas and they're making tamales and <laughs> they're listening to mariachi music and all of the, the fun, you know, the wisdom that the Mexican family in, infuses into their into their children and, you know, the culture and all of it. So I'm really excited that I was able to bring that part of my voice to this project. I'm really excited for you. I'm so proud of you as a fellow Latina woman and I'm cheering for you. We have to come back when this is ready so that we can share it over here as well. We have to do another, another chat um, so that you can speak to us more when I know you're going to be able to give us a lot more details because I know right now where you are in the process you can't share all of it so when you can we would love to have you back what advice would you give to those who want to get into the entertainment business because you have explored a lot of different areas mm -hmm. never give up never give up never take your eye off the ball um, work hard train hard. Uh, when you fall, get up immediately. Just brush yourself off and get back up because, you know, it really is the last man standing. And I would like to know what is next for the Anglophile channel? Ah, well, you know, COVID shut us down like just about every other, you know, 
entertainment, you know, entity in the world. So a lot of what we were doing in person, red carpets, hosting shows, all of that had to be halted. Uh, but moving forward, we're now starting to get back onto red carpets, covering openings of films, hopefully last night in Soho, uh, the Princess Diana movie called Spencer. So we're hoping to do that. We're going to London uh, in the spring of 2022 to cover the Queen's Diamond Jubilee. Wow. Yes, a very exciting time for Her Majesty the Queen. We've been there. We've covered uh, Harry and Meghan's royal wedding. We've been to London to cover the Queen's 90th birthday. And it is just, it's, it's exciting. The country comes together in celebration of their monarch. So we're going to be there for a real huge milestone jubilee next, next uh, June, actually. So that's something that we're looking forward to. I'm also continuing to write and work on other projects. I have a quinceanera love story in the works. I'm also telling a story um, from Lukenberry Prison uh, and uh, a man who, who survived these riots, uh, the government, it was a massacre, you know, in 1968. Um, and, but from this experience, he learned to cut hair. He was eventually released and became a world renowned hairstyle artist and award-winning uh, hairstylist. So that's, that's something that I'm working on as well. And I'm very excited to hear about all the projects that you're working on, whether it's with the channel, whether it is with your writing, your producing. Can you tell our viewers where they can learn more? Uh, yes, well, you know, they can follow me on uh, Instagram or the Anglophile channel uh, website. So it's theanglophilechannel.com. And that's where you can find all the updates on and what projects I'm working on separately as well. Well, thank you, Marlies. It's lovely having you with us today. I am sure that we'll have you back because I feel like we have so much more to talk about and we have to bring you back and continue to... Aww, uh, yes, we have to continue to give lights to all of your projects. So proud of you as a beautiful Latina woman doing incredible things in the industry. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me, Dory. You're a beautiful host and thank you so much. It was an honor to be here and, and I was thrilled to be part of your show. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you all for watching today. I am your host, Dori Mar Bonilla, with a beautiful day, Un Dia Bonito Show. Thank you for tuning in. It's a beautiful morning.